every organization today is seeking the best possible way to use AI and analytics for their data. Say you have the best in class AI and analytics software like Sasfire, and you have huge amounts of data, you might still be left behind if you're not able to access and process this data fast enough. Performance is paramount when it comes to deploying any kinds of AI or analytics in your organization. Hello, my name is Anshul Naguri. I am a global solutions product manager and a technical marketing engineer with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And today we are going to talk about performance aspects of the HP GreenLake Flex solution built for Sasfire. I'm super delighted today to have Hans Joachim Edert join us from SAS. Hans, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Anshul. So hello, everybody. I'm Hans Joachim Edert, an advisory business solution manager here in the EMEA region in the global technology practice team at SAS. So before we dive in, if you're wondering what this solution is really about, I recommend you check out the video in the description below, which talks about the business value proposition of this solution. Now let's begin. The HP GreenLake Flex solution built for Sasfire is an on-premises pay-as-you-go proven high-performance solution that enables you to deploy Sasfire either in bare metal or virtualized infrastructure. It is powered by the open and trusted HP GreenLake platform. So Hans, uh, talking about a bit of history about SaaS, Hasn't SaaS always been a performance-oriented application? Yeah, of course. Um, SaaS has always been very conscious of uh, performance. And um, even before we launched the latest uh, platform, the SaaS Fire platform, um, our customers have always been asking for a very high performance. And that's for the CPU perspective and as well for the I.O. throughput of the underlying storage. So, um, in fact, we do have this sort of a requirement, uh, which says that um, you should be able to provide 100 to 150 megabyte per second per physical core um, for any software, uh, for any hardware stack um, that runs SAS9 in a production environment. And uh, does this performance requirement change in any way with the containerized architecture of SAS Fire? No, not much. In Sasvaya, we do have two main components or workload classes. One is the cloud analytics server, what we call CAS, and then we have the compute server. Um, CAS is the in-memory processing engine in Sasvaya, um, and compute is basically emulating a SAS9 environment. That's what we call the SPRI or the SAS programming runtime environment. So compute basically runs any existing SAS9 code and users are free to write or to integrate code that is written in open source programming languages, just like a Python or R or Java, a part or next to the SAS programming language. So um, performance wise, the expectation from customers is that they can get a, at least a, an equivalent performance um, in SAS via as they were getting in SAS9. Understood. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, almost for a decade now, HP has been running the SAS, SAS mixed analytics workload with our um, compute and storage offerings, primarily for SAS 9. And I do understand what kind of a read write throughput, uh, you know, SAS customers might be looking for when they modernize to SAS fire. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so it's pretty clear that SAS customers and users they want to know what kind of performance they can get from SAS via running on the on the new HPE solution. I mean, that's actually one of the biggest drivers for them to modernize to SAS via. Excellent. So now shall we look at the performance setup, like what we used for our testing? Yeah, sure. So basically here, we use the uh, large config in the HP portfolio or the HP solution for SAS via. So for the Red Hat OpenShift control plane, we have three HP ProLiant DL360 Gen 11 servers. And for the Red Hat OpenShift worker nodes, we have four HPE ProLiant DL380 Gen 11 servers. Okay. This is coming from the large configuration in this solution. Okay. Now, one thing I would like to highlight is that uh, all these servers in the solution come with the latest fifth generation Intel Xeon scalable processors, also called Kimerol Rapids, which are probably the latest in the uh, market out there. 
For this performance testing, we use the fourth generation Intel processors, but I believe they are almost equally powerful um, for a satisfying kind of workload. Yeah, but the fifth generation would give you even better results, isn't it? Yeah, yes, of course, of course. I mean, when a customer orders this solution, they will surely get the fifth generation Intel processors. So that was for the compute. Uh, when you look at other components, storage, for instance, we have the HP GreenLake for block storage MP as the storage in this solution. Now, this is an all NVMe disaggregated block storage solution, which offers extreme performance, high resiliency, and 100% data availability guarantee. In terms of networking, we use 32 gig fiber channel to connect the underlying storage to the servers. So we also have the HP Container Storage Interface or CSI driver, which basically interfaces the SAS via and the OpenShift layer with the underlying block storage and uh, creates the required persistent volumes for the VIA application. Now, Hans, would you like to take us through the SAS VIA architecture components that we see here? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, so here we deployed the VIA enterprise medium package. Um, and as you can see, we have the SAS VIA work namespace with various pods. Um, there's the CAS server running. It's running in MPP mode, um, massively parallel processing mode. Um, and that means that we have one CAS controller and then we have five CAS workers and they are dist distributed across the OpenShift worker nodes. And maybe at that point, let me talk about workload placement because that can help to explain how these pods are intended to be scheduled on, on OpenShift. Yes, yeah, certainly, sure. Go ahead. Okay, so with uh, OpenShift, um, we are using node labels and node tains, and that specifies hints and uh, boundaries for the pod scheduling. In, in our bare metal setup, as you can see in this table, um, we have specified worker one and worker two with the label cars, and then we have worker three and worker four with the label compute. And what that means is that OpenShift will prefer worker one and worker two for the cars pods, and it will prefer worker three and worker four for the compute pods. Okay, I see. And what about tains? Have you specified any tains here? Um, I mean, we could, but we have not. We have only used labels here in our setup, and that's because it gives us, or it gives the Kubernetes scheduler more flexibility. Understood. So basically what we're trying to do is to optimize the resource utilization as much as possible on the underlying hardware, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these are super powerful servers and, and storage, and so it would be a shame to leave them underutilized. Huh? Yeah, totally agree. And would this workload placement vary based on customers' usage and their scenarios, or what, what's the guideline there? Yeah, that's true. Oh, yes. Um, that's actually a crucial step in deciding how SAS VIA is going to be utilized on the underlying hardware. And um, I would still say that customers should always refer to our official documentation to the platform operations guide, and they should carefully adopt the deployment recommendations they find in there according to their requirements. Amazing. Okay, makes sense. So now that we have looked at the workload placement, should we kind of look at the resource allocation for each of the pods that we had? So for that, we, we need to understand um, that the compute engine and the CAS server, they run quite differently in SASFIRE. So while the compute sessions are launched as jobs um, and they terminate after their task has completed, the CAS server is deployed as a service. And that means it's, it's expected to run continuously. Um, so for the compute sessions, we have allocated a fixed um, upper, uh, lower and upper threshold of CPU and memory. And each compute job in our setup was allowed to consume half a CPU up to four logical CPUs and one gig of memory up to eight gig of memory. And of course, these limits, they can vary. Um, based on the customer scenario, but I think they are indicated for a majority of use cases. Got it, okay. And what about CAS? How was the resource allocation there? 
Yeah, so CAS was configured with a guaranteed quality of service that's called QoS in Kubernetes lingo. And um, that was made in order to prevent the CAS nodes from eviction. Um, and as you can see in, in this table, both the controller and the worker pods, they are all assigned 16 logical processors and 128 gig of memory each. Okay, got it. So now shall we look at the benchmarks themselves? Like what uh, kind of jobs did they have and what was the procedure for us to run them? Yes, so we tested two main SAS benchmarks. One was the SAS mixed analytics workload, which runs in SAS compute. And so it's emulating a classic SAS 9 kernel. And then there is the SAS data mining and machine learning workload, which we usually call DMML. And that runs exclusively in the CAS server. Got it. So we basically are benchmarking both the ways that Satisfy can be used by customers. Exactly, right. exactly. So um, let's look at the mixed analytics workload first. And um, this is actually a combination of yeah, data processing tasks like data steps, SQL queries, data ingestion from various raw formats, um, it's sorting data and stuff like that. But it also includes some analytical tasks like uh, logistic regressions, linear, nonlinear models, and um, others. Yeah. So with this workload, we run or we have run a total of uh, 306 jobs. And these jobs were, again, in total, ingesting and processing one and a half terabyte of data. Wow. That's quite a lot of jobs, isn't it? Oh, yes. Um, I mean, many of our SaaS customers run jobs somewhere in this ballpark. Oh, that's good to know. I mean, I can't wait to see the results now. So to start with, this graph shows the distribution of the SaaS compute sessions across the servers. And as you can see, the Kubernetes scheduler preferred launching the compute sessions on the nodes three and four but it was actually able to kind of like spill over new requests to the worker nodes one and two, once the other two servers were actually saturated from a CPU perspective. So you can see that at around 940 in the, in the timeline. And what that means is um, that the average time for pods that being stuck in, in a pending state was actually minimized. Okay, so what you described earlier, the, the tains that we gave, those are actually, you know, helping us schedule the pods in the right way. Exactly. Um, okay, and next uh, on this um, diagram, what we see is the total number of pods running concurrently during the test. And we can see there's an impressive peak of about 220 jobs running in parallel at one point. Okay, um, yeah, the next two graphs actually show the CPU and memory allocations of the pods. And what we were able to see there is that our, our, our boundaries that we had set up before the benchmark, that was actually a good fit for our benchmark, because what you can see here is that all of these sessions, they rarely really allocated all of the resources they could up to their allowed maximum. So the, the range that we had set was actually a good fit for our benchmark. Yeah, and lastly here, I guess this is the chart that uh, you might be super interested in and um, maybe you want to explain it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, this is my favorite. So this shows the total system bandwidth or the combined read plus uh, write throughput that we observed on the underlying HP Greenlake for block storage NP platform. Yeah. It, it shows a typical usage pattern of uh, these jobs where they, they ingest data from the data source in the beginning and then process and work on the data in their respective SAS work folders. At peak, uh, what we saw here was a throughput of 21 gig per second, which uh, boils down to 167 megabytes per second per physical core. And this is uh, you know, exceeding the, the initial requirement that you mentioned about 100 to 150 megabytes per second per core from SAS. Yeah, brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, mind-blowing, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, let's also look at the CAS benchmark, yeah? 
So this benchmark, as I mentioned, is called the Data Mining and Machine Learning, the MML. And it includes um, yeah, various AI and analytic procedures like uh, neural networks, gradient boosting, algorithms, um, decision trees, support vector machines, and, and more complicated stuff like that. Um, and as I mentioned before, we had a CUS server set up in MPP. So we had one CUS controller and we had five CUS workers. And as you can see in this graph, um, the CUS server was evenly distributing the workload across all the available workers, and it was able to fully utilize all the workers. So this nicely shows the, the distributed nature of this uh, processing. Wow, wonderful. So Hans, I have a question here. I mean, you mentioned that CAS is the in-memory processing engine for SAS Fire, right? So does it mean that uh, throughout the job, it was holding all the data in memory and processing it? Or how was that done? I'm glad you asked, Anju. So here's the memory utilization for the CAS benchmark. And even though uh, the CAS server keeps its data in memory, it does not mean that the data actually resides in the physical RAM. So rather, the CAS server leverages virtual memory by default. Um, where the data is partially swapped out to the disk. So in general, all in-memory data is memory mapped to a locally accessible backing store, such as the, uh, the CAS disk cache. Um, and that one is residing on the underlying block storage. And this chart shows the resident set size memory. And this metric clearly shows that most of the 230 gig of in-memory data was actually not residing in physical RAM throughout uh, the, the benchmark. Okay, so this means that the I.O. from the underlying storage becomes even more crucial, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, here you see how it performs. The system was initially busy with uploading the source data and then immediately swapping it out to the disk-based cache. And the peak throughput that we observed in that phase was almost eight and a half gig per second, which uh, is about 217 megabyte per second and per core. And um, you have to know or you have to see that this bandwidth was actually consumed by just five CAS worker pods, as opposed to the 306 uh, compute sessions that we had in the previous compute benchmark. Super. I see that, okay. So basically what we are inferring is that both with the SAS CAS and the compute engines, this HP GreenLake Flex solution built for SAS Fire is delivering the performance that uh, is expected out of SAS Fire. Yeah, right? it really does. That is amazing, Hans. Honestly, I'm so thrilled and happy that we could get the right hardware and do this performance testing because it essentially validates that the HP solution performs against these SAS benchmarks. And I'm sure that we can now go to our customers with confidence of having a viable SaaS via solution on premises in a pay as you go option. With that, I would like to thank you very much for joining for this video and looking forward to working with you more. My pleasure, Andrew. The HP GreenLake Flex solution built for SaaS via offers an on premises proven high performance pay as you go solution to deploy via in either a bare metal or a virtualized infrastructure. If you're looking for more technical details about this solution, I recommend you check out the link to the technical paper in the description below. It contains details about this performance testing, as well as the sizing and configuration aspects of the solution. Till then, take care and thanks for watching.